Right. Great. Right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Collapse Club, where our topic of the week is what can we celebrate at this special time? My guest today is Michael Shaw from Australia. Hello, Michael. Hi, David. Michael is the director and producer of the award-winning documentary Living in the Time of Dying, which came out in 2020. Michael, could you tell us about a little bit about that film and uh, why you made it? Yes. Well, first of all, thanks for having me on, David. I have watched many of your interviews and really enjoy um, the people you bring on and your style, and it's it's wonderful to be here. So, um, yes, well, the the why. Well, first of all, just a little bit about when it came out because it came out in uh, 2020, but then um, it came out right at the time of COVID and uh, where the whole conversation about climate suddenly went in, took a back seat. And just, just to remember back in those times, 2019, uh, Greta was Person of the Year. She was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. That's where we were in 2019. And then suddenly in 2020, almost nothing. So... Uh, I put the film up and then uh, I took it back down. We re-edited it. Um, you know, I put it into film festivals and then I put it up again just a couple of months ago. So it came down for a sort of six to eight months and it came up again. So people are saying, did it come out in 2020 or 2022? But so the why that I made it, um, I was in a I was in a long uh, friendship with Catherine Ingram, who wrote um, Facing Extinction. Uh, I don't know if you've read that essay, but that is an incredible essay. It's an incredible piece of work um, that she continues to work on. Actually, if you read it now, it's quite different to how it was a few years ago. But um, so I was really saturated in. Uh, okay, this is we're off the cliff, and there's nothing that can be done. There's there's we're past the point where this can be reversed in any way and uh, we're heading for climate collapse and civilizational collapse in the near term. And as that landed and, you know, in the conversations with Catherine over a couple of years, uh, I keep coming back with but, 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 you know, but, 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 <laughs> as you do when you're hitting this. But when it really, really landed, um, it was like, well, what is the point of anything? Like, what, what is the point of having this house? What is the point of all those future projections that I thought, you know, this is the future of Michael, that I know him? Nothing made any sense except that I felt a, tre I, I, I felt a tremendous need to share that information, not to bring people down and depress them, but to help people uh, realise in a way that that they could sort of not panic and freak out and sort of land in themselves, in, in to help people come to terms with it in a more um, gentle way, I guess. That was my intention of the film and um, that's why I made it. I wanted spiritual voices on this topic, Uh not just scientific ones. So that's that's really that was really the impetus. I'm really struck by your description of the sensation of the future you vanishing. Mm. I think a lot of us in the modern world are trained to think of ourselves as a as a plan. The plan mm. for my life is <laughs> it's right. I'll get a job, I'll go to yes. college, I'll, whatever the particular plan is, mm -hmm. we look forward to that. And I think as young people, that's sort of natural to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but now we're faced with this full stop uh, by forces that are so immense that mm -hmm. they, they almost defy comprehension. Yes. And it, it, uh, it erases our future, leaving us with what? I ask you. Yes, yes, yes. Well, I mean, um, you know, uh, that it's almost like a, a the, the question provides the answer, doesn't it? Because um, it leaves us with this with presence, 
nowness and it lets us releasing that kind of future project projection um puts us back in the now and puts us back in ourselves in a, in a way there's a tremendous freedom in it and you know i i i grew up you know you know as a big I spent many, 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 many years in and around ashrams, um, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. And um, there was a story that used to go around all the time at that point uh, where there's a guy sort of falling down a cliff and he grabs onto, I don't know if you know this story, you know this story, yeah, and he grabs onto a cliff and he's just hanging on by his fingernails and he looks down and there's some lions down at the bottom of his fall. He's going to get eaten there and there's a strawberry and he grabs the strawberry and it never tastes better. Do you know what I mean? So he he knows he's going to die. Told that didn't tell that story very well. But the point being that I always thought, oh, yes, that awakeness. I would love to have that awakeness, that celebration of presence. But what I didn't understand in those early years was also he would be scared shitless at that moment. Mm. There's two things happening. There's waking up and presence and they're scared shitless and they're all part of the same thing. <laughs> you know, so one, you need one for the other almost. So, um, yeah. So, so, you, so, you, so find that, you find that fear is an ongoing part of your experience of the here and now? Abs- absolutely, I do. And, um, you know, I think... You know, when I look out, I mean, I live in a very beautiful part of the world and, you know, I was walking on the beach this morning as I do pretty much every morning. I see dolphins and we see whales migrating, you know, while they still can. Like I get that every every day. I can swim in that water. It's clean. But when I, this morning, I saw this little pot of about maybe three or four dolphins and I had this sense of like, it's so beautiful and I'm so sad. There's this, this, this combination of sensations. And it's like I, so I come into this presence of look at that, but I can't get away from the pathos either. There's two, there's two things always moving at the same time and that's the price of being awake, I think. Well, this is very interesting. One would think I'm gonna I'm gonna challenge you now, not you, but oh. I, I have I have the same feelings. But here's the question: If we are truly awake and we are truly living in the present moment, what have we to fear? And indeed, what is there to be sad about? Where yes. where does that come from? Yes, yeah. I mean, look, it's a it's a really good question, and um, I. I, I want to come at this from a few different angles because in the biggest kind of scope of things, um, you know, where piece of creation uh, going back to, you know, our death will take us back to its source in this in ongoing cycle, you know, whether the earth's here or not, you know, there's still life out in the universe and exploding stars and what have you, right? So, but... The purpose of grief, and I'm I'm big on the purposes of grief, um, because Meg Wheatley put it really well in an interview I did with her. But she talks about the Chinese symbol for perseverance, which is a dagger hanging over a heart, and she says, when our hearts are cut open. We can feel compassion. That's where our compassion comes from. So when we're feeling, when we're in, when we feel some, first of all, we only grieve for what we love. So love and grief are absolutely entwined. And um, you wouldn't have grief if you don't have love. So, so you know, grief connects us with our love, but it also connects us with each other and one of the great things that I've found, and I'm sure you have too, because you speak to many people on this topic, as I do, when you really dive into this topic, there's a tremendous meeting that, that goes on between people. Like, forget about status and hierarchy and 
um, financial, um, you know, status as well. Forget about any kind of status. You come into this subject and you get real with people and you meet them fully. And I, and I love that. And grief is part of that. And I also think uh, as people wake up, I mean, we, we live in a very grief phobic culture. No, no one wants to feel it. Every, look, we're supposed to be happy, you know, all the time. That's what we're told. And if you're not, then there's a pill for it, you know, or you can go and see a therapist, right? And um, so I, I'm, I'm all for embracing the feeling, you know, honouring the feelings that are there. And I think that's part of the freedom that I feel that's mine to take. And so if grief is there, I, I honour it. And I don't hold out that if I was further advanced and accepted more that I wouldn't have grief. I just think grief is part of the package of being human. And in that circle, uh, sometimes I'm in deep acceptance and uh, I honour deep acceptance, but I also honour grief. I, I think people have this idea that grief is linear. You start somewhere and you get to the end and acceptance. And, or I, I think it's more circular and we keep going around and acceptance is part of, it's another chapter, but it's not the, it's not the end. That's, that, that's what I feel. And, I, and not everybody feels that and, you know, plenty of people that I deeply respect feel differently to that, but that's how I hold it. I I, I agree, and I think it's a, a window into a, a hidden side of what we're going through. My theory is yes. that the grief we feel is the natural accompaniment of immense loss. Yes. The time we're in right now is, a, oh my goodness, sorry, Siri heard me asking her a question, <laughs> wanted to chime in, how annoying. That's a whole other topic. Um, grief is uh, the natural accompaniment of the time of loss that we are now experiencing. However, mm -hmm. as you say, things are cyclical. Therefore, we can use this as an opportunity to look at the other side of the circle. Now is the time of loss and dissolution accompanied by grief. But mm -hmm. the other side of the circle is the time of emergence and birth. And that is accompanied by joy, uh, mm -hmm. by a holy joy at the miracle of mm -hmm. creation, of mm -hmm. growth, of mm -hmm. coming into being. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that our exposure at this time to the horrors of uh, destruction and dissolution mm -hmm. give us a clue as to what we don't, or we're not usually conscious of with respect to joy. Yes. Uh, and to me, that answers my question is, what can we celebrate? My answer is we can celebrate the eternal return of the joy of creation mm. what do you mm. think no no i love that david I, I i think these are all this is all part of the same circular thing isn't it i, I think if we personally th this is just me but if i if i have an idea that i should be in emergence and joy uh, then I'm going to try and pull away from my grief. If I have an idea that I should be in grief and um, uh, and sadness, then I'm pulling away from my joy. So I, 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 I come back again to I honour what's present. I just come back to honour what's present. And, you know, the, you know, it's an incredible time, isn't it? It's, it's like... Um, it's this idea and even this conversation and even this question, you know, this idea of climate change, civilizational collapse as a spiritual teacher. This is it. These questions, these are the sorts of questions that I was asking my 30s in ashrams and um, with teachers. 
And now it's here every day and it's real every day. You know, you can't sort of look, I can't see a pot of dolphins without having to contemplate the beauty and the joy and the sadness and what is this civilization and how the fuck did we get here, you know? And, um, you know, who are we to have done this? Uh, so the whole the whole thing comes up and uh, I, I, I loved your description of the emergence and the joy. Um, and I think that's, a, you know, Karen Perry is wonderful on this. And um, it's all part of the, the, the same story. One of the people in your original uh, film was Stan Rushworth. Do I have that correct? Yes. Yeah. He is an indigenous elder. And you mentioned to me earlier that lately indigenous beliefs are influencing you. Can you talk about that, please? Yeah, yeah. What what an what an extraordinary man he is. You know, I think anybody that watches that documentary comes away with a piece of Stan in their heart. You know, and I was lucky I got to spend a couple of days with him. And um, I think anybody that spends a bit of time with Stan like that is going to come away different. Um, that's the sort of person that he is, and that was certainly true for me. And I suppose. I mean, Stan talked to me about um, the potlatch ceremonies that they used to have uh, in America. Before they were banned, I want to say, they were banned, these potlatch ceremonies, where basically the, the, you know, a tribe would come together once a year and the people with more would share with the people of, with less so that the wealth was evenly distributed once a year. And the people with higher status gave away the most. And when, when you think about the craziness of the neoliberal setup that we're in, uh, where, where the top 1% on a, of the global population now owns more than the bottom 99, it's like we have moved as far away from that as we possibly could. And so that bit and also, you know, the, yeah, within that, this whole idea of Wetiko, you know, where we grab, where we cannibalise, we eat other people's energy and other people's resources and the world's resources. And in Indigenous cultures, they understood Wetiko. You know, this is one of the things that I, I it wasn't like they didn't have it in this kind of uh, nirvana. They understood it. And they, they understood within their cultures how to contain it and bring it down. We celebrate it. We celebrate it and honour it. It's like, how, how did this happen? And um, so I, and I, I guess also, you know, when I hear Michael Dowd, who, who I love, and I've probably listened to every one of Michael Dowd's podcasts, but... Um, he talks about the rise and fall of civilizations and, you know, there's been a hundred of them or something in the last 8,000 years. And, you know, the Sumerians, the Greeks, the Romans, Mayans, Easter Island, et cetera, et cetera. Here in Australia, the indigenous Australians were here for up to a hundred thousand years. They're saying no, no rise and fall of that civilization. The same with the native Americans. To, you know, to, to supposed to be 25,000 or since time immemorial, as they would say. No rise and fall there. In fact, the Indigenous Americans, which I only just recently found out, they had a kind of uh, understanding that you wouldn't dig into the earth, you wouldn't harm the earth, you wouldn't leave scars on the earth. And, you know, to understand why they never, why they never came to mining that's a good reason. And, you know, if there's anyone surviving in our civilization, which I, I think is highly unlikely, but let's say there was a group of survivors somewhere, one of the first things they'd probably say is, right, no digging into the earth. Wouldn't they say that? That would probably be one of the first things. And um, here was this culture that went before us saying that if we'd had ears or the imagination to listen to another culture uh, and, and what they were doing and what they understood. So, uh, 
you know, you, I, you can't think about the Indigenous without also thinking about how they lived in alignment with natural principles, but also the violence of this culture that wiped them out and tried to wipe out their culture as well. Like what is in our culture that we would have to do that and look where it's led us. So, so thinking about the Indigenous is a big part of this for me now. The in Indigenous people sort of represent in our theorizing a uh, communion with the earth, living with the natural environment. These are all artificial constructed terms. Yeah. Um, but there's a sense of harmony, a sense of uh, not trying to rise above or mm -hmm. separate from the Mother Earth, who was the sustenance, mm -hmm. the Father mm -hmm. Sky, who brought the energy, mm -hmm. um, living as, as part of an ongoing system. Mm -hmm. And they were, as you say, they were successful. Uh, I've heard the same numbers, like 65,000 years for the Maori people of Australia, I heard. And as you say, 25 or something for the um, indigenous North Americans. Yes. That incidentally uh, means that they lived through the last ice age, yes. which is a testimony to the incredible hardiness of human beings when they are living in close touch to the earth. Mm. Um, but that story of communion was then interrupted, as you say, by this invasion of Watiko, which I've heard translated as cannibalism, but it's the mind virus that causes, I think it's fair to say, white men to take what belongs to others or not even what belongs, but to take for themselves what exists in the world and, and to amass it for mysterious self-serving ends. Why do you think there were people like that who had to take and a mass and in the process kill uh, first people, then landscapes, and now we think an entire ecosphere. Yeah. Gosh, you know, it's strong. I mean, just, just going back, I just have to go back um, because I know some people will be offended if we don't, but the Maoris in oh. New Zealand. It's, a, it's okay. So Maoris in New Zealand. Is oh, my gosh. Straight, uh, straight uh, okay. my my <laughs> yes. Found yes. apologies for my yeah. white man ignorance. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, we all have it. Please we go all on. Have it. You know, the amount of times. Ooh, I, I hate that. The amount of sorry, times I fucked on. up with Stan is beyond understanding. Mm. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, um, so why? I mean, I, I, um, I think, I, 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 my take. Who knows why? David, but, you know, my take is that, that it's a part of human nature. So we have this aspect of human nature that uh, traditional cultures were on top of. It's like, hey, that's not great. If you do that, there's results to that and we need to contain that. And, and there was methods of containing. So they must have also understood the problem in it, uh, that we're drawn to power and control and we have to watch that. So how did it go where it was being watched and um, looked after to where it was being celebrated and uh, running rampant? That That is something that, I, that I'm interested in. And, you know, I've heard Stephen Jenkinson talk about the Romans and the, their contribution to that. Um, but it's interesting, isn't it? It's an interesting... It's an interesting... I've never heard it put that way, that it was under control. It, it existed and was known, but was under control. One presumes there were uh, cultural mechanisms, yes. uh, traditions. Yes. Uh, like the potlatch is the opposite of, of acquisition. It's the distribution yes. of what yes. one has accumulated into the community. Well, and you um, can imagine, too, in terms of Witiko, 
if that's your tradition and we come together once in a year and the guy with all the status and the power is the one that gives away the most. <laughs> you can imagine how that would disrupt Wetiko thinking, you know, because what's the point of contributing if no one's going to recognise my power and status if I've got it? The guy that gets all the love and, you know, uh, et cetera, is the guy giving it all away. So, um, you know, that, that would have an impact as a, as a ritual. That was had a, would have a direct impact on Wetiko. But, yeah. One, would, one, would, one could guess that uh, that impulse to distribute and to, to rebalance, as it were, actually has roots in the natural order, if you will, mm -hmm. that uh, I suppose one probably could look into the natural world and through deep understanding, see the process of rebalancing and distribution and the equilibrium that comes to exist when uh, the flow of energy is open. Yeah, yeah, I mean, so true. I mean, I, I just, I can't help but feel um, just a little bit more of this neoliberal critique here. You know, as more and more money gets sucked up to the top here, which is which is sort of what goes on in all collapsing civilizations, but how um, unions are attacked and disbanded and how social systems, uh, so, uh, you know, social support systems are underfunded and cut back. Like we continue to suck it. We can, it's almost like once a year, you know, our ritual is once a year, the people with the most, just come take a little bit more for the people with the least. You know, that's that's really what we're doing, isn't it? That's our, that's our ritual um, to expect as normal. And who was it that was talking about this? Um, um, Henrik Nordberg, who I interviewed recently, saying, um, you know, when you want to do something like, okay, we need to give arms to Ukraine, uh, and, you know, there's a whole a different story in that as well, but suddenly there's a billion dollars, no worries. You know, when, when, when we want to make, when we want to stop civilization, we can actually do it. Um, you know, with COVID, everything shut down, no, no worries. When we want to do something, but uh, it's like the the idea that the the earth is valuable <laughs> isn't in people's consciousness. It's a isn't in the people that are in control of the finances consciousness. It's extraordinary, really, uh, when it's our life force, source, force and source. It's extraordinary. I, I've forgotten what question you asked me. I think. Oh I'm gosh, I don't right there. I'm sure it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the civilization that we see now is the end stage of a yes. of a of a disease or a process. I, yeah. I think it's bankrupt and terminal. There's no yeah. question. And for me, it, it it comes it comes down to how are individuals supposed to live mm. in the context of a world civilization that is finally reaping the consequences of its centuries long uh, rampage against yes. the natural world. Yes. How are individuals supposed to cope? And of course that varies individual by individual. The My coping is gonna be different than yours and my situation is different from so many people's. But nevertheless, I think every every individual has their own path, which is now in the context of this great mm. and terrible story that is playing itself out. Mm. Uh, your uh, your film was one of the early attempts mm. to start offering people answers to to, to that conundrum. Uh, mm. Jim Bendel and Dar Jamal and Catherine Ingram, along with Stan, they all have ideas about how individuals are supposed to cope with the situations and the feelings that this terrible story is visiting upon us. Mm. Uh, so where, where are we now? Mm. Uh, 
two, we've been through the pandemic, we are going through the pandemic, we have plague, we have war, we have storm, we have famine. Um, just last week, James Hansen, the great yes. climate scientist, told us that yes. we've got 10 degrees centigrade of warming in the, the pipeline. We're already really hit. Already again? built in. Already built in yeah. with the amount of um, CO2 in the oxygen already. That's 10 oh. degrees, which yeah. is the end of all life on Earth. Yeah. So here we are, you and me, talking by <laughs> this magic system of yeah. uh, talking about the end of all life on Earth. And yet here we are. And yes. it's Christmas time. Yes. yes. So yes, yes. What, what do we say? What do we do? <laughs> I mean, so such a beautiful question, David. I do like your turn of phrase and, um, you know, just listening to you, I could just feel myself sinking into this sort of recognition. And um, what, what, an, what an extraordinary question. I mean, look, in a sense, in a sense, and I, I don't mean to evade the question either, but in a sense, this question, we, we've always known we were going to die. We've always known that sometime far away or not today, you know, not this year, not not in the next 10 years, sometime in some sort of imaginary future, I die, right? It's always away from us. And this brings it very close to home, doesn't it? You can't read the news. Um, like I just came, I just found that James Hansen things this morning before I spoke to you, and it's like, wow, this is this is um, James Hansen, you know, who spoke to Congress in 1988, and everyone listened to him, and probably no one we will listen to him now. But the the question is, yes, he, here we are, here we are, and what now, and. I mean, it, it, there's, so, there's so many layers to it, isn't there? I mean, you know, I'm sure, like, you start these interviews, you know, you do these interviews. I, I do my interviews. I, I lead my groups. I make that film. There's, there's things that happen. It's like, oh, that's something that I have to do. I have to talk about that. Or I have to hear people talk to me about that. And, um, you know, it's like, like if we'd had a conversation, say, I don't know, before my understanding, before your understanding, if we met, uh, I don't know, how long ago is that? A, dec a decade ago, say, when I was still in the illusion that everything could go on as it was, and we'd have this, we'd met and say, you know, David, we're all going to die, you know, and um, we probably would have had an intellectual conversation about where you go, is there life after death, do you ring? Who knows what? But in this moment, in this meeting, here we are, in a contemplation of ending together. And I don't know the answers to this, you know, it's but here we are. It's like a it's like a koan, isn't it? Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's beautiful. I mean, it, there is something very beautiful in the meeting to meet in this place. I mean, that's one of the odd things as well. Like we can meet here very deeply without protection, with, with as little protection as I've known in my life in meeting people. And this is the, these are the gifts of the time in amongst the horrors and, um, and, and more horrors to come. Yeah. 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 Well, to, to, uh... To, to reach toward the end here. Yes. Uh, as I said, it's it's Christmas. I'm not a yes. Christian per se, but I've always yes. loved Christmas. Yes. Um, now in Australia, mm. correct me when I go wrong, um, <laughs> it, it's this time of year is actually the, the summer time, the summer solstice. It's the longest days of the year. Yes. Whereas yeah. here in the North, it's the, the shortest days. Yeah. So it's summertime, and yet it's December. So yes. Christmas happens now in yes. the summer. Yes. How how does that affect people's attitudes toward <laughs> Christmas? <laughs> well, I mean, 
Uh, I mean, in, you know, growing up, Christmas was part of, you know, Christmas holidays, the big break from school. Um, so we'd be have this big break from school and it'd be hot and um, loved it, loved Christmas holidays. And, um, of course, we all, everyone, um, I don't know if it still happens, but plenty of people do still spray snow on their windows, um, you know. <laughs> And celebrate an English Christmas. This is really strange. And the, and even the food they eat, which is very English winter food. So we're still very caught up in kind of that English tradition of, you know, the, the reindeers and the snow and all of that. And people hang snow on their Christmas trees. And But it's actually hot here. It can be, you know, it can be 35, 40 degrees here on Christmas Day sometimes. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a very different, it's a very different, kind of experience Christmas here than Christmas over your way you know yeah we we could we had the like you know a couple of years ago we had the fires um or not quite at Christmas time a little bit after January but they were they were starting well uh do you do you study Christianity at all are you familiar I'm familiar with the Christ story? Have you looked into it? A, a little, I, you know. I went to a Church of England school, so um, so you know, I had you know, you know, a couple of times a week, I'd have that in indoctrination uh, go on. So I, I do have a little bit of his story, but go on. I feel like you want to say something. I'd love to hear. Well, just that um, the story of Christ, of course, is the story of God who decided to become man. Uh, to me, that is a metaphor for the manifestation of potential into the actual, which I think is the fundamental process of the living cosmos, where what is potential becomes actual. And then Christ died, uh, which is to me the return to the to the potential, to the universal, and then was resurrected. And it's the resurrection that interests me, because that is a hint, I think, of the eternal nature of the cosmos and of our experience. Mm -hmm. I, I don't mean the historical resurrection of the one person at a particular historical time, but the idea that those of us who manifest in this world, we live here for a while, then we pass away, and then we come back and we find ourselves in the eternal cycle of life. Um, and I think Christianity is a modified, filtered story to deliver that truth that good news, if you will, to uh, humanity. And it holds true even in this time of the end of the world. And that's what we can celebrate at Christmas 2022. Mm. Does yeah. any, uh, what do you think of something like that? I love that? that. I love that, David. I love that. And thank you for, <laughs> thank you for sharing that. And um, yes, like we come from this manifest form and um, we go to something i mean i i think i was very I, I, it's a similar point i'll pick up on the same point but the james webb telescope pictures really influenced really affected me it's just like wow there is so much life in the universe you know traveling at you know life not like we would understand life like grass and trees but these exploding stars and these black holes and you know light that's taken you know how many billions of years to you know like there's movement and uh for out of that sort of massive cosmos comes form in the earth and us and we go back to what and it is a comforting thought that whence we came from we return to that, that's a comforting thought. Well, thank yeah. you for that. Yeah. I'm, tr I'm trying to find a way to talk about it because yes. as we know, anything one says is by definition false just because anything that can be said is not sort <laughs> of 
the truth, but <laughs> nevertheless, no, we've got we to say it our... anyway because that's what we do. Here, 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 here. All right, Michael, this has been absolutely delightful. I am so mm. glad we've had the chance to speak. Yes, yes, me too, Dave. And I'm a big fan of your work and everything that you do. And uh, thanks for having me on and um, more soon. Yes, I look forward to speaking with you again, for sure. Yeah. Is yeah. there anything you'd like to say by way of farewell to the folks? Ah, happy Christmas, everybody. You know, uh, be kind, be kind to yourselves and be kind to each other. It's a troubled time. Yeah. Very good. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, David. I uh, am David Baum in Seattle. This has been Collapse Club. Uh, I'm doing a little series on this question of what can we celebrate. I'm talking to Michael Dowd and to uh, John Doyle of Ireland and Ireland and Brussels, and also Karen and Jordan Perry. So I hope you'll uh, keep a watch out for those discussions as well. Until we meet again, farewell. Great, David.